Good afternoon, and thank you for listening in today. As of 2 p.m. today, there have been 6,137 positive cases of COVID-19, including 208 deaths. Over 58,000 Missourians have been tested at this point. Before I get started on the normal briefing today, I want to take a moment to honor Kansas City Fire Department EMT Billy Birmingham. His death is the first known COVID-19 line of duty death of a first responder in the state of Missouri. In the face of this public health crisis, Billy and our other first responders have repeatedly and without hesitation risked their own health and safety by responding to emergency calls. His death should serve as a reminder to appreciate all of our first responders and healthcare workers serving on the front line of COVID-19. Throughout our COVID-19 response, we have been in constant communications with doctors, hospitals, healthcare providers, and public health experts across the state. Based on numerous conversations and recent data, the common theme is that Missouri is beginning to stabilize and flatten the curve of COVID-19. A couple of weeks ago, Dr. Witt from the University of Missouri Healthcare joined us to share some positive news about our social distancing efforts. Dr. Witt is one of the seven infectious disease and critical care doctors that are part of the COVID-19 advisory panel. Today, we are happy to have another one of those doctors join us. Dr. Robin Trotman, Medical Director of the Infectious Disease at Cox Health in Springfield. Dr. Trotman is here to share more of his positive trends that we are seeing across the state. I also want to say Dr. Trotman from the Cox Health Center has been a leader uh, when this all began a short time ago of about 40 days ago, 41 days ago when this all started. What they've done in southwest Missouri is pretty incredible. So we're glad the doctor's taking time to come up here today uh, to visit with you about the testing process. Dr. Trotman. So first, thank you, Governor, for the op opportunity to update you and the state more broadly on what we've been doing. I think it's important for people to know that this advisory group has been uh, put together and we meet virtually on a regular basis. And the suggestions and the observations that we've, me we've made over time have been heard by the state. We've seen these things implemented. We've seen policies come out of these discussions and it's something that I'm happy and proud to be part of. I think that this has afforded us time to uh, prepare for a surge of patients. I know the other doctors on the call or maybe in St. Louis and Kansas City uh, have gone through more struggles than we have in southwest Missouri, but what it's done across the state is uh, it's, it's afforded us some time to prepare both locally, regionally, and across the state. And I believe that it's this preparation and that we've done statewide action, whether it be uh, shelter at home uh, ordinances or whether it be restrictions on movement throughout the community. I think it's these, it is these groups of efforts, it's cooperation with the public. I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about how the public has understood the consequences of these shelter at home uh, ordinances and restriction uh, across the community. It's been invaluable to afford us the time. We have literally bent this curve, we've flattened this curve because the models that would have predict, predicted tens of thousands of deaths across the state, those models were informed based on data of how the virus usually would typically replicate if these interventions were in place. So. By putting these interventions in place and not letting infected patients expose as many other potential patients, we've reduced the number of cases and we've afforded the healthcare systems time to get prepared. And it's, it's been quite an effort. It's been a lot of work. We've made some discoveries. We've done some things that we wouldn't have thought we would have ever have to resort to. Um, but I can tell you that we're prepared, specifically in Southwest Missouri. I can say that we're prepared for almost any rational type of scenario. 
almost any surge. We're also prepared for people to reenter the medical systems for the routine medical care. I can tell you that now uh, we have multiple test modalities, multiple platforms in place. Uh, we're working with several different labs. We're working on in-house testing. We have ICU beds and we have capacity. We have ventilator capacity. We have the personal protective equipment, whether it be the masks, the face shields, the gowns, and we have innovative ways to reprocess this equipment that never before would I have dreamed we would be reprocessing what is typically a disposable mask, but we have ways to validate these processes. We know they're safe. So we also have treated our first patient with convalescent plasma, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We've enrolled patients in clinical trials, and we're working with other healthcare systems collaborating. Cox and Mercy in Southwest Missouri have worked with Greene County Health Department to stand up a mobile testing unit. And for about five weeks, we're testing 60 to 80 patients per day, keeping them out of the healthcare system, providing quick 24 to 48 hour results. So it's this, it's this preparation that has allowed us the luxury of having conversations to even discuss reducing some of these restrictions, some of these statewide uh, ordinances, it's, it's because we've had this time and support to prepare. So I know, that, I know that our health departments are strong. Our state has great local health departments. I know we're going to be able to monitor this disease as we move forward, as we relax some of these restrictions. I'm working with our local health department to monitor hospital preparedness. So the healthcare system's job is to be prepared. The public health's job is to identify infected patients, do the tracings and isolate those, and hopefully mitigate subsequent transmission. So right now, the, uh, these processes are stood up and ready to go. We're communicating with the health departments on a, on a daily basis. And these are, these are really exciting new developments uh, that before this pandemic, I, I was never part of. So knowing that we have excellent relationships with public health and the, the healthcare systems is encouraging. The other thing I want to emphasize is that we know that routine health care has to continue. So there are going to be non-COVID-based trickle-down consequences of people not seeking out their operations. These have been called elective procedures. I would prefer to call them medically necessary and time sensitive. So people are going to have to resume their standard medical care. And we're aware of this. And so I want people to know that the healthcare systems are safe. We're taking exhaustive measures across the state um, to make these clinic offices safe, to make it safe for a patient to come in and have a procedure. And so people need to feel safe re-entering the healthcare system and we're cautiously re-expanding our services. We're working with the health departments to monitor disease. We're monitoring our, our staff, our stuff, and our space. Those are the three S's that I like to use. And what that means is our per personal protective equipment, our assets as far as testing, making sure our healthcare workers are well. And so I want people to know that they don't need to be afraid to reintroduce the healthcare system. It'll be different. Uh, you might sit in your car and you might make a phone call before you enter. You might be called in instead of sitting in a crowded waiting room. The offices are clean. The healthcare workers are being screened for symptoms. So I want people to be encouraged to reenter. Uh, the routine medical care on a slow, calculated basis. Then there's three other things that I want people to understand. I want people to be flexible and understand this is a dynamic process. And as we, as we release some of these restrictions and as the healthcare system starts to normalize again, there may be bumps in the road. We may see blips in disease, but we're going to be aware of those and we're following those along with the health departments. And we may even have to resume some minor restrictions uh, in movement as we, as we release some. So if people will be uh, patient with us, this is going to be a long haul. I know that lifting the, the shelter at home is going to, be, uh, it's going to be an answer to prayers, but this is all contingent on people around our state adhering to those same fundamental principles of keeping your distance from people, being aware of your surroundings, not going to work if you're sick, these little things like hand hygiene, maybe you still wear a mask in public, those are what are going to afford us the ability to continue to release these restrictions in our movement and will make it safer across the healthcare system. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is for the people who've had resolved disease. We've had some hints, some little clues that we might have an effective treatment in what's called convalescent plasma. And that would be where if a patient had coronavirus infection, they had the COVID disease, 
after a few weeks, when they're better, maybe three weeks, they might seek out a call to their primary care doctor or the blood bank or a local health care system uh, and see if they would be a candidate to donate plasma. That would be like a, like a standard plasma donation, except the thought is it has antibodies that might protect another patient. So the next patient that we have that's critically ill in the hospital, it would be wonderful if we had these tools, this plasma that's banked. And Dr. Williams in the health department issued a, a press release a while back, and so we're hoping people will start to consider, once your disease is resolved, donating plasma. The other things that I wanted to talk about are the things that have made me excited to be part of this healthcare system, part of the statewide uh, mission, reprocessing personal protective equipment. Again, something I never thought we would do. We have support from the state. We're doing it locally. These were exciting new things that we're doing. We're making PPE. I think a lot of uh, cities have brought in private business to make things like shields or gowns, and we're doing that in Springfield as well. And we're enrolling patients in novel drug studies, and we're learning as we go. So it, there is some hope. There are some exciting things that I think we're going to take on the back end of this. I'm encouraged about the humanity and respect that's being given to healthcare providers with this. So I want people to understand that on the end of this, it may be a bumpy road. Things are looking good. We have excellent statewide support, testing capacity, and I want people to know that uh, there is going to be a bright, brighter side on the end of this. That's all I had, Governor. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Traub, when I was talking to him out in the hallway, he said that he's got some kids at home that are doing their homework today, but they're going to be watching Dad up here uh, give his presentation today. So for you children of Dr. Trotman's at home, you should be very proud of your dad, uh, one, for being up here today to speak to Missourians, but really for what he does for a living about saving lives across Missouri. And it was his action that did save lives across our state. So I want to personally thank him, and uh, thank you for being part of that family that, that done that. We are encouraged by the recent data, which is why we feel we're in a place to move forward with our recovery plans and begin reopening our economy. As I said, our Show Me Strong recovery plan will be deliberate and data-driven. It will rest on four main pillars, including expanding our reserves of PPE. The PPE shortage has been a top concern in Missouri and nationwide as health professionals and first responders respond to COVID-19. Today, I am pleased to announce the deployment of a decontamination system in Missouri to assist with the N95 mask shortage. Starting next week, hospitals, healthcare providers, and first responders will have the opportunity to utilize the Battelle Critical Care decontamination system to safely decontaminate N95 mass. Through this system, we will have the maximum capacity to decontaminate up to 80,000 N95 masks per day if needed. By helping conserve PPE, this will be a huge benefit to our overall recovery plan. Today, Director Richardson is here again to give us an initial update on our recovery efforts. Todd? Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Dr. Troutman, for uh, making the trip to Jefferson City. Your insights have been uh, incredibly helpful to the state as, as we responded to this event. Um, I'm excited today to talk about a few things uh, that we're doing to tangibly uh, aid not only in the fight against COVID-19, but also in how we get to a recovery. In the past uh, week, major strides have been made to prepare Missouri for that safe and phased reopening of the economy. In alignment with Governor Parser's pillars of a show me strong recovery, we are actively responding to the nationwide PPE shortage with innovative and new technology. As the governor mentioned, next week we'll be receiving a decontamination system from Battelle Laboratories at no cost to the state of Missouri. The decontamination system is the result of two decades of research, and it's received approval through the Food and Drug Administration. The Battelle system is 100% federally funded through a FEMA and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services grant. This system uses hydrogen peroxide vapor 
to sanitize N95 masks up to 20 times per mask, and as the governor mentioned, is capable of decontaminating 80,000 masks per day. The Bedell decontamination system will bolster our supply of necessary PPE and will be a critical component of allowing our health care system to gradually begin to perform postponed and non-emergent procedures. Most excitingly, this system will be functional next week. Additionally, on Monday, the Department of Economic Development, in consultation with a wide array of state government employees and, and private partners, has launched a personal protective equipment marketplace. The marketplace can be accessed at DED's website at ded.mo.gov. It will allow public and private sellers of PPE to connect with buyers and will help the state to determine supply and demand of all types of personal protective equipment. The marketplace will also help the state to project those critical shortages and where necessary, purchase and distribute PPE to public and private health care providers. We're also working, along with the governor's pillars of a Show Me Strong recovery, to improve our testing capabilities and volume. We partnered with Microsoft to launch a public-facing platform that will help screen Missourians for symptoms and connect them to nearby testing locations. Microsoft has provided this platform to the state of Missouri free of charge for the next six months. Together with community partners, and public health experts, private sector leaders, your state government is building a foundation that will allow Missouri to effectively manage COVID-19 in the near and long term, and most importantly, will ensure a robust economic recovery. Todd, thank you very much. I uh, also want to mention today on uh, the Battelle machine that I want to thank the federal delegation for their part in that, trying to make sure they're keeping supply. I talked to Senator Blunt, Senator Hawley uh, yesterday and the entire uh, federal delegation. I just want to make sure people know that they're working up there every day to try to help us here back home, and I want to thank them for their part of what they're doing. Another essential pillar of the recovery plan is expanding testing capacity, and we are rapidly working towards this goal. Today, the state public health lab is implementing new testing criteria so that we can expand our testing even more in the state of Missouri to meet the guidelines and the goals we've set out. Dr. Williams is here to provide more details and also to give an update on the WIC and the Department of Health Summer Food Service Program. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Governor. Um, first, I'd like to discuss some of the changes we have issued to providers today related to our testing criteria at the Missouri State Public Health Laboratory. DHSS has expanded the criteria for people who can be tested through the Missouri State Public Health Laboratory. This expansion recognizes our increased availability of tests and reflects our strategies moving forward as we move out of the acute phase to box in new outbreaks as they arise and to give doctors and other providers like Dr. Trotman a broader decision-making ability as to who gets tested. The new criteria allows us to do comprehensive testing, in other words, testing everyone, staff and patients, in congregate facilities for both staff and the patients, both symptomatic and asymptomatic. It also expands the criteria so that we can test more first responders. To not only increase the amount of testing that can be done, but also to increase access to those tests, more than 100 sites can be found throughout the state now, and we've added an interactive map of those locations to our website at DHSS. We are also in the process of validating serological tests and hope to make that available to the citizens of Missouri in the next few weeks. We will then have the capacity to do 175 tests an hour that's obtained by a simple uh, blood prick of your finger. This type of test collects the blood and it detects the antibodies of a person and tells whether or not they've been infected, even if they didn't know it, with COVID-19. This test will be especially important for people who were symptomatic but didn't get tested at the time, such as first responders and others who are potentially around multiple patients who may have had COVID-19 and become infected without knowing it. I also want to take an opportunity to provide an update on WIC and dispel any myths that are out there during this pandemic. The Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, known as WIC, is still running strong. 
and actively supporting current participants and enrolling new participants who may now be income eligible due to job loss related to the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, the WIC program served about 100,000 women, infants, and children in the month of March, enrolled, enrolled 3,500 new participants. The WIC program not only offers nutritious food items to meet participants' specific needs, but also provides valuable nutrition education and breastfeeding support. Over 36,000 sessions of nutrition education were provided in March. And the United States Department of Agriculture approved a waiver to remove the federal requirement that participants have to visit the clinics in person through May 31st. This waiver allows local agencies to maintain social distancing and to serve participants who may be quarantined and unable to visit the clinic. Pregnant women, new mothers, and families with children from birth through fifth birthday can learn more about enrolling in the Missouri WIC program by visiting the Missouri WIC website at wic.mo.gov or, or by calling the participant support line at 1-800-392-8209. At the Department of Health and Senior Services, we also have our Bureau of Community Food and Nutrition Assistance, working diligently to ensure children have access to meals during school closures. This bureau was approved for waivers by the United States Department of Agriculture to allow schools and other community organizations to begin operating the summer food service program earlier this year, in March, to provide children with much needed meals. In addition, these waivers are allow allowing children to have the meals delivered directly to their homes or be taken and consumed off-site rather than eaten in a group setting. There are over 800 meal sites available in communities throughout the state, and we're incredibly thankful to all of those hosting those meals for Missouri's kids. A map of meals can also be found on our website. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Appreciate it very much. Kelly, uh, let's go to questions. All right, thank you, Governor. The first question is from John O'Sullivan, KMOV. On May 4th, what limitations on which business can reopen will be in place? We're working on the policy and the guidelines for that, For but I'm, I will tell you almost every business in the state of Missouri will be able to open their doors. People will go back to work. There will be some guidelines we'll have with that, but the majority of them will be open. Do you see, Governor, uh, limitations on the number of people that can gather at one time? We, I think we will. I think there'll be guidelines for that, how many people can be in groups. Uh, again, we're going to allow people to go there, but social distancing is going to be important. Just what you heard the doctor say in here, the expert in that, uh, that's going to be a key role to how we move forward. And I think it's going to be important that we maintain that social distancing for some time. So there'll be guidelines we're going to give to the cities, the counties, uh, across the state for state policy. And uh, uh, it'll be where people can get out again. All right, thank you, Governor. This question also is from John O'Sullivan. Franklin County announced last night it will be opening up several businesses starting this weekend. Are you okay with that, knowing that its mortality rate based on number of cases and population is one of the highest in the state right now? Well, uh, number one, Franklin County has to make some of their own decisions, and we've always uh, focused on those local-level decisions to be made. However, uh, the state order is still in effect till May the 3rd. Uh, so whatever those orders they had can be more stricter than what we have, but it can't be less. So Franklin County is still under the state order, and they'll have to follow those guidelines. Thank you, Governor. This question is from Jason Hancock, Kansas City Star. Governor Parson, Senate Majority Leader McConnell said today that he'd rather let states financially squeezed by COVID-19 declare bankruptcy instead of extending the federal aid that would require further deficit spending. Do you agree that the federal government shouldn't step in to provide direct aid to states facing budget shortfalls? Well, several parts to that question. Number one, I don't believe the states should file bankruptcy. I think the states should be responsible for how you spend your money. Uh, and because you did a poor job of managing it, whatever those states may be, I don't think the federal government should come and bail you out. So that part, I agree with what, the, what Senator McConnell said. I don't think the states should file bankruptcy. I think if you get your position into bad management, then the people of that state's going to have to understand they're going to have to do without a few things to get back to where you control it. It is one of the good things, one of the great things that I like about this state. Regardless what party you're with, we all know you have to balance the budget every year. You can only spend what you have. You can't spend more. And I think uh, other states need to focus on that same responsibility, but it's not right for them to get bailed out. And then other states like Missouri that does it right uh, ends up bailing other states out. That's not what the federal government should be doing. 
All right, Governor, thank you. This question is from Brian Hosworth, Missouri Net. Governor Parson, Missouri lawmakers return here to Jefferson City on Monday and have just three weeks to finish their work. From your perspective, what are the top issues they should focus on when they return? Well, I'm just going to take one, but they come here to do the budget by May the 8th. That's what they're coming back here for. That's the, their main objective, uh, my understanding of that. And that's the one thing that we really need to focus on. If that's what they're coming back for, we need to try to get that budget done. If that's what their plans are. All right. Thank you, Governor. This question is from Dick Aldrich, KGL, KJLU Radio. This week, the University of Washington study estimated that we had reached the peak of COVID-19 infections and deaths last week and that the curve of both should now start trending down. Does that go along with the metrics you were looking at? And are we trending down on new infections and death? With all due respect, we made that decision over a week ago here in Missouri. And I'm going to go back to what I originally said that I thought was critical for our state and for all states. But I'll just say Missouri, having our own data to understand what's really happened in our state to be accurate. I get the predictions of a lot of people across the country that want to make predictions or or want to make forecasts or models. I get all that. And I'm thankful that there was other doctors in other areas. I talked to Dr. Trotman before we come in here that give him some advice. But the reality of it is, I'm going to go back to what I said a week, two weeks ago. It is Missouri data that I'm going to make decisions on, not some prediction. We believe we were headed in the right direction over a week ago when we decided to, relift, re, to, to lift some of the regulations we have and open this state back up. All right, thank you, Governor. This question is from Ashley Bird. Uh, from Learfield. Yesterday, Governor, you signed uh, House Bill 1511 and 1452. Can you talk a little bit about that bill? Yeah, it was the military reciprocity bill that we did yesterday. It was one of the priorities that, that I had going in this year, and it was uh, fortunate enough to be one of the things that got done early in the session, uh, one of the very few things that got done this year. But it really began, for our military families that come through the state, whether it's Fort Leonard Wood, Whiteman, wherever it might be, it was for the spouses of those military members that they can go to work when they get here so they don't have to, if, if, especially right now, let's just talk about nurses, for example. If you're a certified nurse, you could come into Missouri and start that job tomorrow if with a military family. Before, it would require maybe trainings or the licensing process, or it would cost money just simply to do that. The whole concept is when they come here, the number one concern the spouses of military families had is are they going to be able to go into the workforce as soon as they get here? And Missouri, you know, has always been a military-friendly state, and I thought that was something that we really needed to do to have that full reciprocity. So if that spouse comes here, whether it's teaching school, whether it's a medical profession, whether it's an engineer, whatever it might be, that they can go to work in our state. And I'm proud that we got that done. I'm thankful for the legislatures for their work getting that done. But it's a good day for Missouri, and it's a good day for support of our military when we do that. All right, thank you, Governor. This question is from Alyssa Nelson, Missouri Net. Do you plan to select others to join your stimulus money informal working group to make it more of a bipartisan and diverse group? Uh, I think we have. I, my understanding is I was briefed by the administration earlier. I think we're going to put there'll be a couple more Democrats on there. Uh, I think there'll be somebody from the Senate and somebody from the House that'll be on that. Here's the important thing, I think. I think because we had this advisory group to come in here, I think people all of a sudden thought that they were going to have the say over where this money goes or how it's divided up or anything. That's not really the case. What this, we picked the state treasurer because the money is going to flow through the treasurer's office, but this is really taking a look at the federal guidelines is going to tell us what we do with the money. They're just helping us get through the process of the guidelines, but they're not going to have the ability to be able to say we can send this money wherever we want to send it. That's not the purpose of that. I, I think for whatever reason, I think somebody had the, kind of the, it got put out there, maybe the media put it out there thinking they were going to have the ability to do that, but they really don't. It's an advisory role is what, what they're at. So we're going to open that up to public meetings. There were some concerns about that. So we'll open it up and we'll put some more people on there. But again, I, I want to clarify what their role is. All right. And the final question today for you, Governor, is from Alex Smith, uh, KCUR. Fewer people are currently being tested in Missouri each day than were being tested earlier in the month. With testing numbers declining, how can we expect to reach the 40 to 50,000 tests per week that you said we needed to do by the end of the stay home order in May? Yeah, because I think everybody in this room, Dr. Williams, uh, Director Richardson knows how important this is to me. And it's not about just the testing as of today. We got to be able to test uh, large volumes of people across this state. And we're going to get to that point. The reason the numbers are low right now is because the criteria itself, and it's why I announced today and Dr. Williams did, we're expanding that criteria where we can do more and more testing. 
where we're now we're going to give the providers the ability to just actually, if somebody walks in there, say, if you want to test them, you can test them. They don't have to meet the criteria. We have to open that up to go to different segments across the state so we can kind of check whatever areas we might be, whether that's a Springfield, Missouri, or maybe that's small town, Missouri, we can do a sample testing. The other thing is so important why we got to be able to do more testing when we do have an outbreak or a hot spot, as we call it, a nursing home. We got to be able to have the resources and the testing capacity to go in there and isolate that right away and to be able to figure out who the employees are, who the people are in those homes, and to be able to test that. And by doing that, we're going to be able to test a lot more people. And at the end of the day, we're on track to meet those testing guidelines, and I believe we will get there. And uh, every day I'm going to push these directors as hard as I can push them to make sure we're moving up on those testing numbers. All right, thank you, Governor. I have a couple of questions now for Dr. Trotman. Okay. Uh, this question is from Philip Sitter, the Jefferson City News Tribune. Dr. COVID-19 can obviously be fatal, but there probably are people who may not yet understand all of the nuances of this disease or of the pandemic generally, even as they've had to live with the consequences of social distancing. Can you summarize, summarize why unmitigated spread of COVID-19 is dangerous for everyone? Thank you. That, that is a very good question, and I, I welcome that question because it, it, helps, us, uh, in, it helps us understand the, what a contagious disease is, what an infectious disease is. The person who is asymptomatic, who transmits the disease to the next person may not severe may not suffer severe consequences that person transmits it to a therapist that goes into three different nursing homes in a week and you have very sick elderly patients so what we look at is we look at number 1 the impact on the healthcare system from those people who may have mild disease some of them some small fraction maybe 10 20% may end up in the hospital some of those may end up on the ventilator and some may die, despite not being advanced age or having multiple comorbid conditions. So this is one of those diseases where even the person who thinks they are young and invincible, there is a small fraction of those people that will have severe consequences. Those people also move about the community the most. Oftentimes people who are, people who are asymptomatic shed the most virus. So it is not about looking at whether or not that one person will have severe consequences as it is how much can they move about the community and spread it and the odds are they will spread it to someone who would be more vulnerable so i think it's important that people understand themselves i i know for healthcare workers we've had to change our paradigm completely we now look at ourselves as the potential source now healthcare workers in the hospital wear a mask so now i look at my patient as being susceptible to me were I to have the infection and not transmitting it. So this disease has flipped the paradigm quite a bit. It's not just about preventing sick or, or people with comorbidities from coming into the hospital. We've, what we've done, and we've done it in an excellent fashion, is we've prevented asymptomatic transmissions and pre-symptomatic transmissions in the community. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Trotman, this one is from Luce, uh, Lucas Geisler from ABC 17. What challenges has your hospital faced in getting a hold of PPE? So that is, that is seven weeks of work, uh, full-time work by uh, a whole team at our healthcare system working with uh, the local health department. I know Mercy's done the same. I'm talking to doctors in St. Louis and Kansas City. We've all suffered the same uh, crisis in being prepared with PPE. We have not personally at my hospital, we haven't had a critical shortage where about we weren't able to use standard of care PPE. But what we know is that there's a market and anytime there's a market, there's gonna be people selling things that may be inferior marking up prices. So we've seen price gouging, we've seen um, items not exactly what they were uh, intended. So N95 masks that wouldn't meet uh, strict fitting criteria. Uh, we've struggled with testing reagents. When you hear about testing kits, that goes all the way from the molecular machine in the lab and the reagents to the tube, to the transport tube, all the way to the swab. And so every part of that supply chain has been affected. Even the labs that can, that can do thousands of tests per day may run out of one simple little pipette, one little tube to draw up reagents could, could stop there 
uh, production. So we have an entire team at our hospital that just works on on the supply side of things. So again, we haven't had those uh, crisis level uh, deficiencies, but we're we're prepared for it. All right, and the final question for you, Dr. Trotman. Uh, you may have to help me with this, the pronunciation of this drug, but have doctors at your hospital prescribed the hydroox oxidochloroquine? <laughs> Hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> Thank so you. To I'll, COVID-19 patients. Sure. And have you seen any hoarding in that industry? Uh, oh, that's a great question, and that's a timely question today because people will have seen the news that uh, some preliminary data that haven't been published in print, haven't been peer-reviewed, uh, show that drug's not as effective as we would have hoped. It could be harmful. We've known all along that hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin can worsen or make new cardiac arrhythmias even leading to death. So personally in our system, uh, we've used hydroxychloroquine sparingly because I, I was informed by the original data. I looked at the data out of France. Those were not very compelling uh, to me and knowing the side effects. The problem is it's a desperation. And so, yes, we saw, we saw hoarding of the drug. We saw people buying drug off shelves. We saw it in short supply. Uh, fortunately, we haven't prescribed a whole lot of it. We've tried it in desperation. But, yes, that drug uh, was, uh, was the victim of some hoarding. Doctors, uh, health care providers wanted to use it prophylactically, which it's not indicated. Uh, there's some new uh, guidance from... Uh, that's out there from the federal government on actually uh, saying not to use that for prophylaxis, meaning just taking it every day to prevent COVID. And there's, there's no evidence, and we shouldn't be taking it just because we were exposed. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Dr. Williams, I have a few questions for you. Uh, this question is also from Lucas Geisler, ABC 17. What does the state need to make its boxing in testing strategy? What do they have to do to make it work? Well, thank you, Lucas. Uh, what we need to do is to have the testing capability, and we're actually doing this uh, as we speak. Uh, I was at the state lab last night, and it just gave you a, an idea of just how widespread this is to meet a, a group of couriers that came in from way down in the boot hill as the National Guard was taking testing sites to the very northwest up in Andrew and Nottoway and, and Buchanan County. And so in that one snapshot, you had the two examples of the state where we were trying to box in. We have two outbreaks or potential outbreaks. And so we're going in now that we have more capacity to test and we are testing everybody. Uh, we are testing uh, staff. We're testing uh, uh, residents or patients. And in one case, we're testing workers. And so uh, that's where we want to get to uh, uh, forward. You heard that uh, as we have more tests, we have the ability to do that. And so let's say in mid-May we have an outbreak in a nursing home or in a manufacturing plant or um, a congregated facility like a prison, we will be able to have the ability to go in and test everybody. All right, thank you. Uh, this question is from Philip Sitter, Jefferson City News Tribune. The director of the CDC this week warned that a possible future wave of COVID-19 infections later this year could be made worse by the return of flu season. And he recommended that more Americans get the flu vaccine and get it early. What's the role Missouri can play in getting more flu vaccines available and how soon? Yeah, Philip, thank you. Uh, and as you know, only about 45% of Americans get their flu shots. And that's really not due to a lack of vaccine. That's just that they uh, didn't do that. I think one thing from a public health perspective that we applied to this strategy uh, uh, about three years ago, two years ago, our uh, rate of getting vaccinated wasn't very good. So the governor and the first lady were kind enough for the last two years to uh, lead up our campaign. And we increased the number of vaccinations by 15 percent, which I think was 150,000. So uh, as, as, as we move into next year, uh, it's just really important that the uh, public health message get out. You really want to get your flu shot next year uh, because uh, for lots of reasons, one for your own self, but also certainly one thing we've seen tremendously is, is that as we've moved out of flu season here in Missouri this year, which was about two weeks ago, it very much helps our bed capacity, our ventilatory capacity. It helps our uh, health care providers like Dr. Trotman. So uh, thank you for thinking that far ahead, but we are really going to do a very robust campaign for people to get their flu shot next year. All right, thank you, Dr. Williams. This question is from Madeline McLean, KQTV. Counties are beginning to roll out Abbott's new rapid testing through its ID Now machine. 
Per NPR, researchers at the Cleveland Clinic say it has a false negative rate of 14.8%. As research emerges questioning the accuracy of these tests, does DHSS support Abbott ID Now continues use? We do, Madeline. Uh, I was on a conference call yesterday with the head of Abbott Labs and, uh, and the uh, Admiral um, Girard and uh, Ambassador Brooks. And, and at this point, we think that test is incredibly helpful. Uh, I, that data you uh, mentioned, uh, we've looked at. Uh, we will continue to validate it in our state public health lab. But at this point, we have confidence in that test to do what we want it to do, which is point of care testing that you can get back in 13 minutes. And we will probably run a, a small sample in which we also run that against our own labs in the state. But we have uh, uh, dispersed those uh, machines, and we think they are a great tool going forward to get people, especially in that boxed-in strategy. We used it this weekend, to be honest with you, um, where we can go into a nursing home and quickly test staff or people that are, are we're worried about maybe they were in the room with somebody with COVID-19 and get back the results in 13 minutes. All right thank you Dr. Williams this question is from Sebastian uh, he asked rural counties such as Saline and Montauk now have some of the highest rates of COVID-19 cases in the state related to meat processing plants what is the state doing to respond to these outbreaks? Well, Sebastian, you heard me mention earlier that the National Guard was taking a, a bunch of uh, tests up to northwest Missouri last night uh, when they met us there, and that is what they were doing. Uh, we identified a potential, uh, 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 some cases, and so we uh, instituted our boxed-in strategy there. You know, when you bring up rural Missouri, as you know, 50 percent of our cases have been in two counties, and much of it mirroring the uh, nation's experience has been urban. But what we know is this, is that if you look at that, we're already seeing in rural Missouri an increase in uh, cases as we plateau in other places. And when we look at those, uh, the thing we get concerned about is those patients tend to be older and they also can have more chronic health diseases. So we worry about their outcomes. The, the ones that we've seen so far, I looked at it this morning, uh, are also tend to be associated around work uh, and people working in close proximity to each other. And that's probably different than what we're seeing in St. Louis and St. Louis County and Kansas City. So we're paying very close attention uh, to work site kind of congregated uh, facilities in rural Missouri where people by the nature of their job work very close together. And so uh, rural rural COVID-19 is different in the way we approach it probably than urban. Thank you for the question, though. All right, thank you, uh, Director Williams. This question is from Rudy Keller, Columbia mm -hmm. Tribune. Last week, Governor Parson said Missouri must increase testing to 10,000 a day mm -hmm. and that the state was performing about 3,000 tests a day mm -hmm. and that the numbers would, quote, double our capacity right now in the next week, and I think that is doable to do on that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the state hasn't reported more than 2,000 tests on any day in the past week and has fallen behind Arkansas, Illinois, and Oklahoma in testing per capita. What is keeping Missouri from meeting the goal that was set last week? Yeah, well, right now we have the capacity in Missouri to put out to do 50,000 tests a week. We can do that through our 16 labs if we needed to do that. What you're seeing is you're seeing uh, division here in that, let's take Illinois. We were doing more tests per capita than Illinois, but Illinois' curve continues to go up. They continue to have more sick people. And so the numbers you're looking at reflect symptomatic people. Uh, those are people who are sick. And, and so the numbers you're mentioning are a great reflection that we don't have as many sick people. But to the governor's point earlier, we've now, as of today, about three hours ago, broadened our criteria. And we are now going to be looking at broader scopes of people other than people who just have coughs and fevers. And as we do that and we do more boxed in and what we call sentinel testing, in other words, we will increase our test numbers because we have the capacity to do that. And we think that's really important as we move away from the acute phase to a recovery phase. And the final question for today is from Joe McLean, ABC 17. It's kind of a follow-up question regarding Saline and Montauk County. Yeah. What, if any, conversations have been had with the local health departments in those counties? Um, uh, I've had numerous conversations uh, with one of those counties uh, because, again, 
similar to what I said before, they have an industry there in which they've had a spike in cases associated around that industry. So one of the things we're planning to do is to move one of our Abbott machines to that county so that they can do rapid point of care testing. We also have something else we're going to unveil uh, next week in which we will be moving into at least one of those counties, if not both of them, because we have seen a spike in both of those rural counties, and we're going to be doing a fairly intensive, robust, uh, um, uh, targeted testing in those two, in, in at least one of those communities, I know, um, to uh, in increase our testing there to get at what might be the underlying cause of that. All right, thank you. Governor? Thank you. It is because of Missourians' quick actions that combat COVID-19 that we are in a better place today. Missouri has predicted to be much worse at this point in time, but because we have been aggressive in our COVID-19 response from the start, we have drastically improved these predictions and are able to move forward into the economic recovery phase. On Friday and throughout next week, we will continue the specifics of our plan for May 4th and the guidelines that will be in place as we move forward. We are hopeful about the future and look forward to seeing Missourians safe, healthy, and back to work. Before I close today, there was an article wrote in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And if all of you remember, I've never really said anything about the media since I've been behind the podium since I've become governor. But one of the most disgraceful things that was in a paper today in our state was when the editorial board of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch referred to all Missourians outside of that region as simple-minded rural Missourians, which makes up a vast majority of the people in this state. When bias outlines like that do things like that at a time of crisis when people are dying, when everybody is trying to work together to make this state better, it is most one of the most disrespectful articles I have ever seen in my career to refer to people of this state because we are Missourians. All of us are Missourians no matter where you come from in this state. And most of us are all proud of it. And people work hard all over this state. But for some media outlet, and again, I want to be clear that I'm talking about the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that wrote that article to talk about people in that disrespectful way should be held accountable and I hope they are someday by the general public to make sure they understand that they have responsibilities at the jobs they do also. Thank you and God bless.